Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. And coming up on today's episode. I get addicted to um, housewives. I mean, you know, uh, Beverly, yeah, Beverly Hills housewives. I get addicted because they get to be, many of them are friends and many of them are people I've known or been acquainted with over the years. It, 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 several are. But you just get, it, you just get like, you're like, I wonder what's happening over there today. Like, <laughs> you really do. We bring up a bag of money every night. And I'm like, give me that because I don't know how much we're going to, I think you have to pay cash to leave this hotel. And I, I don't know what they're going to, I don't know. I don't know what anything costs. It doesn't say anything anywhere. I got hacked at my own, I did it. Somebody called me and get, asked me for a code and I gave it to them. Don't, no, Apple. No one will ever call you and ask you for any of this information. Do not give anybody information on the phone. Strong, independent women in TV comedies have always been a hallmark of the genre. Dishing out laughs while solving problems with wisecracks is comedy gold. For 11 seasons, starting in 1993, there was one woman on NBC who perfectly sliced and diced the punchlines with her sharp tongue delivery. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometko. Join me in today's guest from Frasier, Perry Gilpin. Hi, Perry. Hi, Steve. It's so nice to see you. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm good. <laughs> um, I watched, I just caught this morning on Roku, thanks to Roku, the most recent episode of the Frasier reboot. You weren't in it enough, was my Aww, that's impression. Nice. I wish you were in it longer, although you had the best first line. I think you so. looked like crap. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, do you miss playing Roz all the time? Um, I did miss. I do. Yeah, I, it was a great character, and I loved her. Uh, I loved how, um, you know, what a, like how adventurous she was at, in the beginning, and then it was such a huge change when she had a baby. Alice. And yeah, Alice. And so I really missed the. Um, I don't want to say the word freedom only because, but the, the freedom of just doing whatever you want to do pre-kids. And I always knew that. But once I even had a, I didn't, you know, my sister-in-laws were all having babies while I was fake pregnant. And I would talk about my pregnancy and they would have to be reminded that I wasn't really pregnant. <laughs> but some, but it, because my character was, there were some things that I experienced before I ever had children that I you know, gave me pause, gave me stuff to think about. Not pause. I wanted kids, but I just, wow, life really does change. Um, how, how close were you to Roz in terms of who you are and who she was? Uh, pretty close, I think, in a lot of ways. I was, I, I, I had my wild years earlier. Once I moved to LA, I was kind of like most people here, kind of in a bedroom community, kind of. Early to bed, early to rise, healthy eating, and you know, not not well. My if anyone hears that, they'll laugh their ass off. But I was not like her at the time. I had been more adventuresome in my personal life, and so I don't. But I didn't know anyone that wrote on the show at that time, so I don't know where they got their information if it was based on me. But I think really what she was based on was I think. She was what uh, everyone in the, uh, she was a, a creation of that fabulous writer's room, you know, and, and particularly the women in the writer's room, I think. She was saucy. Yeah, and, and uh, good at what she did, really good. And she really was self-reliant and she, you know, felt confident about her work and about who she was which I just loved playing because that's the opposite of me. <laughs> and she knew how to keep Frasier in line. Yeah, and that was part of the job was to, you know, she was saddled with, was this guy that didn't know what he was doing, but it was actually really good once he got going. You know, we just had to get him, like, you know, just the technical part of it. And, um, and I think that was, I love where we came into the story in the pilot, which was, you know, a few weeks in. So... They were used to each other's uh, idiosyncrasies at that time, but she was still dealing with his, you know, his greenness. Do you ever watch old episodes? I hadn't for a long time, but I, I, when watching these, you know, they'll they'll kind of roll right in to them, mm -hmm. and um, and we, I, we start we watch my husband and I and kids have watched a couple, and they're 
they just are amazingly good. I think, and I know I'm on the crowded side of the room in this regard, I think it's one of the best sitcoms ever in the history of television. I it's right so. up there. The I writing, the acting, the casting was perfect. Yeah. Um, was it easy to get right back into it when you did this most recent reboot? I was worried. I was really scared. Like, what? Am, how am I going to do this? But I walked on the set, and it was a different sound stage. But it was, um, but it was on the same, you know, at Paramount. And you know, I just sort of walked in, and Kelsey was in just in the middle of it all. He was. Uh, he directed it. He directed that episode, and I lo I always loved working with him as a director. He's a great director, and um, it just. I don't know, and the cast was so friendly, and there were s several people I'd worked with for all those years and kept in touch with. So there were a lot of people around to just enjoy it and lap it up, and you know, really just make the most of it. So it was. I was scared, but once we started, and he did a great thing at, when the door opened, and he responded so hugely. You know, it kind of gave the audience permission to do that too or I don't know cued them to do it I want to say but it was very sweet and I felt very thrilled to be there and it was thrilling to hear them respond that way and it was thrilling just to be on the stage with Kelsey again mm -hmm. you know there's uh, one episode in particular that I watch whenever I'm in a bad mood or whenever I want to see something that makes me feel comfortable uh, there's the episode of ham radio which I thought was yeah. so hysterical where you do this um, radio play, a mystery, uh, <laughs> that is just so very funny, and the timing and everything is so great. And I, and you had had dental work. Roz had had dental work, and she's trying to do her part. And uh, and that one line that always cracks me up is, "I can't believe one of my guests could be a multiple murderer." <laughs> so funny. Um, and you know who wrote that was David Lloyd, who wrote. You know, Chuckles the Clown. He oh. was on Mary Tyler Moore, and he had written for Dick Cavett and Johnny Carson, and he was our uh, consulting producer, and his son, Chris Lloyd, ran the show. And, um, and you know, of course, we had just the most amazing creators of the show were David Lee, Peter Casey, and David Angel. And um, besides that fabulous bunch of writers, there was a whole writer's room, and we just... It, we just had the most, I mean, we just had the most amazing writers. That's just all there is to it. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was a, a classic landmark series. But he, but what I was going to say is David Lloyd phonetically wrote out Mubbable Mubbabuzz. Like, so, yeah, he knew, he, like, he didn't just leave it up to me, which he, and he was always such a, so kind. It, he would have been fine if I wanted to do it myself. But I was like, oh, my God, you went to all this trouble. This is perfect. I know just what to do. Like, then also, you're not just trying to do it over and over again. And, do you know, you you can actually do it the same because you've phonetically done it. But it was so great in the script. And another time they did that to John, they put, like, he was supposed to be talking about a town in Korea when he was in the Korean War, I guess. And so they they put they put it in the script. And he went and did his homework, and so he pronounced it perfectly at the table read. And they all went, whoa, and he got, you know, he got an ovation, you know, and then not a standing, you know, he got a clap. They clapped for him. But then after that, for the rest of the week, that town got, name got longer and longer. And, and you know, and John... <laughs> You know, John kept, and it was just very funny because they, you know, the writers and the actors on that show just really had a great time together. Does it seem like it was that long ago that you actually uh, began work on Frasier? It's like, what, 30 years or so, isn't it? Yeah. Does it seem that long? Yeah. Oh, it does. <laughs> <laughs> time doesn't fly when you're having fun. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it, you know, I think about it all the time, and those those are marked pretty clearly on in social media, you know, it's been 22 days and, three, you know, 22 years since Fraser. Like, you see it all the time. I wouldn't have thought about it if it weren't for social media. But they do kind of mark that. And um, and so, you know, you think about it. You It makes you think about it. And, you, and I think that's good. I think it's good to remember how long it's been. Why? Well, because I, I think L.A., the time sort of sneaks up on you a little bit. There's no season. You know, there, there, are, there are seasons, but there's no really marked seasons. And uh, you can, I think we are all, because we're all, you all, you do the same thing your whole life. <laughs> 
you know what I mean? Like yeah. you, so it's sort of, oh, you're like, am I, um, I'm doing what I did at 20 now. And that is, is that what I had planned? Is that what I wanted to do? And it is, but, is it? but yeah, but it, but it's also like, wow, I've been doing this a long time. And a lot of times you'll have the exact same discussions with your colleagues, you know, about this or that. And it's funny because there's ne it all comes down to the roll of the dice, you know? Yeah, it does in this town, doesn't it? It does. Are you glad you came here? Are you glad you do what you do? Yeah, I am. I am very glad. I have no, I, I have no regrets. I have always, I grew up in a family of actors. I was on SAG insurance as a child. My fam, my whole, my mom, but local actors in Dallas, you know, people that did commercials and things like that. And so we, everyone's always lived kind of audition to audition or job to job. And, um, you know, you have to, you're freelance. So you are prepared for the downtime and you try to stay prepared for the downtime. And I think sometimes you don't, you know, I always say, if you if, if you want to get a great job that you can't turn down or that you have you know you can't even argue with buy a non you know refundable ticket somewhere you've, you're dying to go you know it's just always like you're always tied to this place and I wish I wish I would have had a few more adventures but I will and I think also the pandemic ha is making me feel that way and the uh, that time we all spent indoors I just really I, I enjoyed it at the time, but now I really want it back. <laughs> but it's tough, tough. What was the best decision you ever made regarding your career? Um, auditioning. Well, I uh, the I think the best decision I ever made was I produced a play. A friend of mine came to me here in L.A., who was dating a guy. I don't know what happened to her. The last time I ran into her at a coffee shop, so at that time she was working on Survivor. She was on the production team for Survivors. I don't know what's happened since. So if, But she was dating somebody here, and she lived in Chicago, and I think she had a whole other life in Chicago. But she was dating somebody here, and she wanted to... She. she, she met me through him and she said, I'm gonna give you $65,000 to produce a play. And all I ask is that you put him in it. So I was like, are you sure you wanna <laughs> do that? You know, and I, and she said, I am. And so I partnered up with a guy that's still a great friend who'd gone to Yale Drama School. And I spent a lot of time at Williamstown Theater Festival and knew them and I spent a lot of time in New York. I lived in New York and I knew those, I knew this kind of group of people and, um, so he and I started looking for a play and we would invite, we'd find a play, we'd invite all of our friends over to, you know, we'd rent out like a dance studio or something, invite everybody over to listen to the play. And about four times people would go, don't, don't, no, do not spend that money on this. This isn't worth it. And finally we found this great play written by Richard Greenberg while he was at Yale. And it's about a lot of Yaleys. And, um, and and Neil knew him, and it was his first play, and it was called The Moderati. And um, we loved this play. It was hilarious. And we got Ron Link, who was fabulous comedic director, to direct us, and we did it at the Tiffany Theater. And I had always kind of had a little bit of a of a of a snobbery because uh, I came from theater, and I came from I went to school, you know, and studied a lot of theater before I got here, and. I was like, everyone on stage in this town looks like they're auditioning for a TV show. Like, why don't just, you know, but then also, you know, they wouldn't have good pro props, you know, like walls would go like this. <laughs> I remember somebody like trying to answer a pay phone, you know, and the whole phone came down. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, you know, because everyone's just trying to get to TV or film, right? So, but I'm like, but you know, use your stagecraft, you know, it would, it would bother me. So I wanted to do this play, and we did this play, and Jeff Greenberg came to see it, and he said, I, he let, waited for me, and he goes, I want you to come, uh, I, want you to, can, I want you to come audition for this pilot that I'm working on, and, um, and I did, and I got it, and it was for Jimmy Burroughs, I auditioned for Jimmy Burroughs, it was called Flesh and Blood, and um, I was just so, first of all, I, he saw me there and based that decision based on my work, which I was so thrilled about. So I auditioned for television in my theater thing. But also I was so um, 
warm. You know, I was not rusty. I was like ready to go. I was a well-oiled machine and anything that was asked of me in the audition, I felt like I could do. And I felt like I could do it well. And I just felt so good and I got it. And I wound up doing that and I wound up doing another sh show for Jimmy and then I wound up doing Frasier. And I think that producing that play was probably the best decision I ever made. Oh. <laughs> Thanks for asking. You're welcome. Never Thanks thought for about answering. that before. It was a long answer. Sorry. No, that's okay. This is a long show. Oh. <laughs> uh, was your uh, career, since you came from a family of actors and auditioners, and was it predestined that you would become an actor? Probably, but I didn't look at it that way. My mom was a school teacher when I was born, and she was. I was born while she was actually in at Baylor in college studying to be a teacher but and she'd married a she they married very young my she married a guy that was trying to be a pastor and I was born nine months to the day mm. and it was like I was really born nine months to the day I mean there was nothing so they were very very sheltered and she was you know in her finals I was born May 27 she was in her finals of her sophomore year and so I am. Um, I grew up with my mom, and I wanted to be a school teacher. All the years she wanted to be a school teacher, and um, um, then after about six or seven years of being a school teacher, she would team teach with this other young teacher, and they had both taught special ed classes in, in their student teaching days. And once that's on your resume, you you can't not do that anymore. And it's just she just burned out. They they team taught sixty kids. They had. 30 a piece that they combined. And that's just, no one can do that for mm -hmm. very long. And so then she went to her first love, which is why she went to Baylor to begin with, was to study with Paul Baker. And she, and, and she remarried my stepdad and he said, be an actress if that's what you wanna do. So I saw her in a play, I saw her in Picnic. She was playing Midge. She was on the stage and the lights lowered on her as she was dreamily looking up, you know, thinking about I can't think of the name of the guy, of the character, but she was, you know, her sister, the guy was in love with her sister, so she was feeling, it'll never happen for me, you know, and she was a little sad, and the lights dimmed, and my sister went, Mama! <laughs> it was, and my mom, I just saw as the lights went out, my mom went, you know, and I was like, that looks like fun. <laughs> that is fun. That's what I want to do now. So I did it. It's so funny that you should mention born, being born nine months to the day. Uh, my father was a Baptist minister, and um, my mother was more strict than he was in terms of religion. And I remember when my sister got married, she had uh, my first niece, their first granddaughter, nine months to the day <laughs> right. after they got married. And it was like, she made certain everybody knew. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you had kind of the same background. Totally. My dad was t wanting, wanting to be a, a Baptist preacher. He was at Baylor. He played um, football at Baylor, and he was second string. And I think the coach put in a third string guy, and he got upset and he left. Left school, left seminary. He wasn't really in seminary. He was in school. He hadn't gone to seminary yet. And became a DJ. <laughs> left the ministry behind. Yeah. And he, was a, and he went all over the country as a DJ. And in fact, one of our writers on Frasier, Ken Levine, finally put it together. He goes, I interviewed your dad when I was in college. He ran the station here in LA. And so he always sends me air checks. So he, was, he wound up in Philadelphia. And then he was a weatherman in Philadelphia. He was like the first uh, action news, Channel 6 in Philly, the weatherman. And he, he'd make it really funny because he wasn't a meteorologist. And he was like, why are you making me the meteorologist? I don't know how to, I don't, I can't, I don't, haven't studied this. So he made it funny and everyone loved it. And I hear story, he died in a parachuting accident in 1983, but I hear stories about him once a month. Somebody, you know, tells me something hilarious that they thought was hilarious that he did on air. But my favorite one is that they were interviewing some woman in a towel. Like it was the local you know, WPVI, they're interviewing a woman in a towel. And when they came, and for some reason she was in a towel, when they came back to the weather, he was standing there in a towel. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to take, just to make it funny. And it, I think that's so funny. But anyway, so he was, you know, he was a young guy. He was parachuting and he, he left us. But they were both raised in churches in Dallas, in, in Houston, actually, in very, very you know, they were very religious. That's why they were at Baylor. And, and um, but honestly, for both of them and 
I'm telling something a little bit out of school, but I think it's okay. Um, they both were adult. They were children of alcoholic fathers, and um, and they they're 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 both the dad. Both of their dads were married to women that didn't know. No one knew it was a disease. No one knew that it was something that they could they could do something about. Get treatment for. Get treatment for. And um, one of my grandfathers had come from world, just basically back from World War II like that, and the other one what didn't that wasn't the situation but they were both severe alcoholics and they so their their children were terrified and they found church and they got really 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 involved in church and it was all about church so they really followed those rules and in texas it's no drinking and you know no gambling no movies a lot of people were upset with my mom later when we all started doing movies and stuff and as time went on you know, my mom went to my pastor's house one day and he poured her a glass of wine and she was like, Bruce, you know, <laughs> she yes. enjoyed it. But that but that was a big deal. But he's like, it's not that's OK. You can have a glass of wine. But it was a big deal. It was in my in my family. My father was a Baptist minister. His brother was a Baptist minister. Wow. But his brother was in uh, Phoenix. He ended up in Phoenix and my father was in Cleveland. Uh, and in Cleveland, you're much, uh, you st- I don't know, at the time you stuck closer to the rules. There was, I remember in our household growing up, no drinking, no dancing, no smoking, no playing cards. No cards, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and uh, his brother, on the other hand, uh, would enjoy a glass of wine now and again, mm-hmm. and my mother's eyebrow would go up, <laughs> and she'd develop a tick. <laughs> but uh, uh, it's funny how those... Um, Good behaviors. I don't know how else to describe it, but uh, it's it's a a different kind of an upbringing. It really is. I mean, I mean, it really. I was raised to think that um, you know drinking was such a taboo, and then and then you know it's that's like a, you know that's like a Romeo to Juliet. I mean, <laughs> that's like. <laughs> That's <laughs> like make it even more interesting, why don't you? Right. Yeah. Well, I've been through rehab, so oh. I'm in AA. Um, Congratulations. Thank you very much. I celebrated eight years recently. You did? Yeah. I had gone 10 years and then moved back to Chicago and was triggered, uh, but I'm back uh, and feeling really good. Well, one of the anyway. most amazing experiences I ever had was at, re- at my sister was in rehab at. Um, Sierra Tucson, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not supposed to, but my sister has passed away, but she, uh, we were at family week, and she had a son who was about six years old, and um, we were doing this circle, and there was this, we'd been divided up into groups, and there was about a, maybe a 65-year-old man in the, this group with us, and I really wasn't sure why he was, he was completely alone, there was a lot of us, but in our family there, and he was part of our group and um, was a very sweet guy. So he did the circle and he didn't have anyone there. He had no family to do the circle with. So they said, you know, you can just do it to sit in the chair and we'll guide you through it. And you can talk to whoever you wish was here or want to be here. So he did this thing with his mom. And it was all about, you know, it was kind of about an incident that had happened that had really, really scarred him. And he needed to talk with her about it and kind of forgive her. It was incredibly powerful. It was the most dramatic thing I've ever seen on film, in a stage, anything. It was really powerful and beautiful, him talking to his mom. And I realized that's why we're, in, he's, we're all in the same group, because my sister needs to hear her little boy, needs to hear what her little boy might be feeling when he gets to be 65. It's like, sort of like the cycle of life. And... It was really, really powerful, and it was helpful to all of us. I was in uh, a place in Tucson also. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It was a, a really good experience to be removed from your normal setting, and we had the same kind of family situations, um, role-playing, mm-hmm. uh, and none of my family could be there either, um, but uh, they had other people in the in the um, program uh, who would sit and and role play to help you out uh, 
and my sister, who who was also in AA, came down to visit me there. Uh, oh. Finally, but she was going through cancer. She had cancer at the time, and uh, it was the first time I'd seen her in ages. And she came down, and she'd been getting chemotherapy, and she was bald. Uh, I had, and I, I to see her like that, uh, and she was my big sister, and she's since passed away. But um, it's funny the thing life, th things that life throws throws your way. Uh, <sighs> Um, That's a memory. You know, I was going to share a memory with you that you brought up earlier, that ham radio, that that episode. My mother had had cancer for 15 years, and she'd been living with me for about six months, and she passed away that week. And Kelsey called me. I, David Lee, one of the producers, one of my great friends, he, you know, he called. He goes, okay, what what do you need? And I go, what do I do now? You know, and he gave me the name of he knew what to do then. And then, um, and then my uh, we were do my my stepfather and sister were at that taping, and Kelsey called me that day. Of course, when she passed away, she passed away on Friday, and we would always shoot on Tuesdays. And he goes, "You don't have to do this. We can we can go down for a week if you need to." And I was like, "No, no, no. I I need to do this. I need to be there with you guys." And um and so David Lee made me do that multiple members thing about 500 times. I swear we did it a hundred takes of that and the audience would just laugh and we'd all laugh and it was the best medicine, it truly is. Um, what's the best piece of advice you've gotten since you were in your career? Hmm. Or who made the big, biggest impact on you? <laughs> I think Jeff Greenberg said to me once, he goes, you're really strong. You don't have to play, <laughs> play strong. <laughs> I don't know why that makes me laugh, but he's it, it, it really, you know, and I unfortunately told my husband that, so I hear that a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. You're really strong. <laughs> you know, like a strong character. You don't have to come in the door, like you don't have to add that in as a, something to play. It's already there, which... <laughs> thought that was pretty good advice. Do you think that's true? I uh, I don't know. I think it's true in acting. I don't I'm not sure if it's true in real life. Um do you like living out here? Yeah, I do like living out here. I love California. If you hadn't been an actor, what would you what would you be doing? Well, you know, I grew up in Texas and Texans have a very very strong sense of being a Texan. At least we did. My family did. And I was very pr I'm the kind of person who really takes that on too. Like I really love being a Texan. I don't always love being a Texan these days. But I do want to say that there are a lot of fabulous, wonderful Texans and um I don't think their voices are being heard right now necessarily. And that's I don't live there anymore. I don't live there now, so I don't. It's I don't. I'm not trying to take that on. As we all have our things, we need to decide how much of our time we're going to give, you know, to help make it the way we think it should be. But um, I do love Texas, and um, and so I feel so guilty saying how much I love California. But I do love California. And I love the U.S. I love being in the uh, being American, but I love to travel too. Mm -hmm. Why do you keep asking me that? Where Where do you want to be? Do you like being in Chicago? Uh, not this time of the year. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Yesterday, when I was sitting on a plane waiting for the wings to be de-iced, yeah, you know, I wasn't too happy about it then. And with my Uber driver being an hour late, and I was afraid I wasn't going to make it, and you know, it's a, lot it was of stress. a whole bunch of anxiety. I tell people. Uh, you know, when I when I first moved back after having lived in California for 30 years, um, a lot of people would say, ah, "What are you gonna do about winter?" Well, I grew up in Chicago, so you know, I was used to winter. <laughs> I had forgotten what it was like, yeah. and and the first uh, I remember the first few times I went out driving my car in winter and getting stuck because I didn't have snow tires and I had front wheel drive or rear wheel drive, whichever. But I would, you know, wave money outside the, out the window of my car to young men who were passing by to push me out of whatever <laughs> snowdrift I was in. Of course, some parts of the country could get arrested for that, but <laughs> nevertheless, uh, it, it seemed to work. Um, oh, that's nice. That's nice to think. I can't, I can't even imagine 
that, that, that wouldn't work everywhere. We'll be back for more in a moment. Kelsey called me that day, of course, when she passed away. She passed away on Friday, and we would always shoot on Tuesdays. And he goes, you don't have to do this. We can, we can go down for a week if you need to. And I was like, no, 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 I, I need to do this. I need to be there with you guys. I always think of that song, The Best Is Yet To Come. I always think of that. I mean, L.A. is a place where you can slip so easily into ageism and feeling, you know, feeling, um, uh, what is the word, victimized by growing older. But, you know, my mom died at 55. My dad died at 43. Wow. And my mom used to say, well, old people are the survivors. Those are the people that got to do it. You know, so they get to do it because she was terminal for a long, long time. So I don't, I, I, I had that experience and I think that really helped me um, try not to get too down. I also have 19 year olds. I, I had kids later in life, you know, so I, I was older than most of the moms around, not all of them. There were a lot of, there were a few my age, but that was really funny. Like there was this one mom who would, let, she'd say, well, they're, they're they're off, uh, you know, they're in the golf cart on PCH. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? You know, and then I realized she's 33 years old. You know, she's a kid or she doesn't know. What. <laughs> Can you call me for, you know, like, oh, my God. But it was, I'm like, hmm, she's just living her life. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm on, I go on <laughs> sites now that are like um, dating for seniors. <laughs> oh, God, don't do that. <laughs> Too late. Don't, don't go on those sites. And you and you look at the pictures and you think, oh my God, these are old people. <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> date an old person. <laughs> exactly. <Is> that, <laughs> how screwed up is my thinking? <laughs> <laughs> oh well. I and and I, I have regrets about that too. I made some bad choices and left some people behind that I shouldn't have. In retrospect. Uh, <laughs> But you had a good reason at the time, and you probably would still Did probably I? be the Did same I? reason. I don't know. I second guess, guess everything I do. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> Not I mean, good, huh? Well, well, I mean, but 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 did he really? I, I said this the other day. I was regretting something, and this person said to me, "Don't are your reasons still good?" And I go, "Absolutely." It's like, well, they, nothing's changed about that. No. So then I, I wouldn't, there, I only regret that I, it didn't go a different way. I don't regret what I did. Why am I, I'm like, um, I'm, <laughs> I'm preaching to you. Well, I appreciate We're it. We're the children of preachers. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I was talking to you the other day on the phone about, uh, I think the first time I met you was at, at the Cannes Film Festival when you were there to host that uh, um, charity auction. And, uh, and I remember you being uh, somewhat nervous about what to do. What am I, you know, what do I do here? Well, it was, I didn't know, okay, so I, l lovely Lily Tartikoff, who I adore, and I read an article about her when I first, not in the, my early years here, I remember getting the LA Times and feeling like an adult that I was reading the paper. Of course, all I ever read was calendar. <laughs> <laughs> and there was this big, you know, she was married to Brandon Tartikoff, and they were the golden couple. And it was all about her years as a dancer and how what she wanted to do while she was here on this earth was work for people with breast cancer. And she was really involved. And um, I just remember absorbing this article and thinking, what an awesome person this is. So I say this with, I revere her. But w I hadn't seen her for a long time. Her husband, Brandon, had died. And we all went, I had gotten involved with the National Breast Cancer Coalition after my mother died. She died of a, a very rare form of sarcoma. But, but I got, my friend Arlene Sorkin got me involved with the National Breast Cancer Coalition. So we were going to a luncheon where Dr. Susan Love was speaking. And um, I walked in with Jane Leaves and Maggie Randall, our my our producer and um, our line producer Maggie, and we were signing in. And I look over and Lily's signing in, and I go, and her, she, I don't think her husband had been gone a month, and I'm like, what are you doing here? She goes, I can't get enough. Like this is, I'm like, oh my god, it was just so sweet that that's what she did 
for comfort, you know, was to go listen to someone speak about helping people get better and, um, and how to deal with it psychologically. So she asked us all if, as a cast, we would go to Cannes and host this party for, uh, it was for a, a breast cancer event. And everyone, I guess, said no. I got the last phone call, and she goes, you have to, because everyone else has said no. And I'm like, but I, I'm getting married this summer, and I'm now throwing my, 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 my brother's wedding, you know, in June, and I'm getting married at the end of July, and, well, you'll just still have to go. Anyway, we get there. My husband goes. Another couple went with us. Turned out to be the most, she, I think she gave us our room. Our room was the most beautiful room at the Hotel du Cap, which is, you know, just a fantasy. And I think she, I, I, I don't know how we got that room. But anyway, we, my husband and Chris went to, what's the name of the fabulous, um, you know, like it's where James Bond was. You know, it's where they all, the casino there oh, in Cannes. right. Carlton's, I think. They all went there every night and um, and ate these hamburgers. They were, they were called the American. They had hamburgers with french fries in them. I'll just never forget the french fries were in the hamburger. It was genius. And, um, <laughs> and he would just, was doing well. He'd bring up a bag of money every night. And I'm like, give me that because I don't know how much we're going to, I think you have to pay cash to leave this hotel, and I, I don't know what they're gonna. I don't know. I don't know what anything costs. It doesn't say anything anywhere. I'm scared to death to ask, you know. So we go downstairs, and we um, we we we're, we've got our cash, and there said so there'll be no charge, Miss Gilpin, and I'm like <laughs> so relieved, so relieved. But also that's she was just so generous. Okay, so but she was so generous. But every morning I had to get up and get my hair done and go do stuff something in my makeup and all that and you can you have seen for yourself what an ordeal that is and so then uh what so then I go to this party okay so the party was Calvin Klein and Isak Marazzi am I saying his name right had given all of this stuff to QVC to auction off about the beach like beach towels tanning stuff sunglasses bathing suits all this stuff and the party was going to last until all that got auctioned off. So I'm like, what? it could be hours, <laughs> you know? And um, and I don't really know. They're all movie stars that I don't know. It's not t- It's not the Emmys. You know, it's not TV. I don't right. mean it that way. It's not the Television Academy. It's the, it's a group that I don't know very well. And, um, and so I start walking around. My husband's behind me at one point, and he's doing that thing where, you know, you act like you're walking down the stairs, and then you act like you're walking... Because you... <laughs> just... <laughs> Just because we we don't know what to do anymore, and that and what was brilliant was it all sold out in like forty five minutes. So I didn't have to do it very long. But I had on a million dollars worth of jewelry. I'd never had anything like that. And then and I was I just my makeup and hair and my dress. I mean she just treated me like a princess. But so I really wanted to do a good job. But what was really cool was I was interviewing people like Jeff Goldblum and I and and people knew so much and. I ran into Salma Hayek, and so I just, I'm like, will you talk to me for a minute? She went, of course I will. And I said, you know, the National Breast Cancer Coalition shows. And she just started rattling off more information than even anyone at the organization knew. She was a complete advocate. She was really there for that reason, you know. And she gave so much information. And it was an opportunity to talk about breast cancer with people that obviously really cared about it. But, um, and, and, you know, knew a lot, and it was just... I was so nervous going in, it turned out to be a blast. Yeah. I remember we were talking. <laughs> you could tell I didn't know how to finish that story. I could <laughs> see that you could tell. I was trying to wrap it up. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I just, uh, the thing that I remember so clearly is that uh, we were talking just about what you were doing there and what you were going to be doing. And, you know, the whole setting is so spectacular. And uh, at one point, you remarked that there was a guy who looked like Greg Luganis. <laughs> I said, <laughs> It is Greg Luganis. <laughs> He's here with me. Oh. <laughs> yes. And that's the, that was the real. Oh, that's right. <laughs> it's like, oh, I, I knew that. <laughs> you know. Oh, well, you guys. Very, oh, at yes. At the time. Yes. Yeah. Oh, hmm, I see. I forgot about that. I did forget about that. <laughs> uh, it was I've, just such a good time. He said, do you, you keep in touch, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I just know I, did, I was used to watching do yoga the, classes with him huh? in Malibu. I used to oh. do yoga classes with him in Malibu. Oh, yeah. Do you know Scott Henderson? No, I don't. Scott is was uh, I think at the Olympic. He's a um, ice skater. 
I think he was at the Olympics with him that year, or whatever. And they're good friends. But I, 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 those Olympians hang out together. They do. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? I don't know. You know, I played the mom of an Olympic athlete on a show called Make It or Break It. Uh-huh. And, and, it and it was all about elite athletes and how they basically, it was for ABC, it was for uh, ABC Family. So it was really, a, it was about teenagers. But it's also one thing that we really delved into was how those kids really don't have a childhood. No, they don't. Greg, uh, I remember, went to live with his coach at a very young age. Um, but he was so gifted that uh, it, it worked out well for him. Four gold medals, one silver, one silver. I remember the first time I went to his house, he had a 12-foot deep swimming pool in his backyard and had the Olympic rings on the bottom of the pool. <laughs> and uh, me, being a smartass, said, uh, well, don't just stand there. Dive something. <laughs> so he, he went from a seated position on the a platform he, he went into a handstand, Wow! no trouble at all. Uh, and so I'm, I know that he was uh, probably fabulous at, at your yoga class too, <laughs> because he was the most flexible person I've ever seen. But he went into a handstand and then, you know, did a pike and right into the pool. And it's like, oh my God, <laughs> you are Greg Luganis, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. He really did bring a lot of um, atten- great, good, positive attention to that sport. Yeah, he did. I just uh, saw on the news last night he was honored by Orange County into some uh, hall of fame they're beginning for athletes or noted Orange County residents, former residents. I was going to drop him a note. You should. I will. I'll send him. I have his email address. And we're Facebook friends. And we'll be right back. I get addicted to um, Housewives. I mean, you know, uh, Beverly, yeah, Beverly Hills Housewives. I get addicted because they get to be, many of them are friends and many of them are people I've known or been acquainted with over the years. It, 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 several are, but you just get, it, you just get like, you're like, I wonder what's happening over there today. Like, you really do. How much time do you spend on social media? Do you like it? I really got, I was doing a little independent movie with a bunch of friends and I was saying, what's Twitter? You know, what's Twitter? And they're like, come here, I'm signing you up. You're going to love it. You know, and so I really, really got way like into the rabbit hole of Twitter. And then somebody, I got hacked at my own, I did it. Somebody called me and asked me for a code and I gave it to them. Don't, no, Apple, no one will ever call you and ask you for any of this information. Do not give anybody information on the phone. But anyway, the only thing they did was hack my Twitter account. They changed the password and I couldn't get in. And I thought, okay, (laughs) that's a sign. Stop it. And then also Elon Musk was taking it over. And I just have such a problem with how he's handling everything. Who doesn't? He's a madman. But anyway, so I... I do believe that he's right about free speech. I think we, I believe in free speech, but you have to be, uh, you know, you have to be ready for the consequences. And if you're inciting violence, then there should be consequences. Mm -hmm. And how can you do that? It's free speech. (laughs) Right. Uh, I'm biting my tongue. You are? Yes, Why I do you? It's your show. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what do you watch? I'm not telling you. But I anyway. watch The Amazing Race. I've liked that yeah, for a yeah, long time. Yeah, that's that great. I fun. want my daughter and husband to do that. I think they'd be a, well, actually either daughter and their dad. It would be great. Both. <laughs> I think that's a great show. It is. I enjoy it. It keeps me involved. I get addicted to um, Housewives. I mean, you know, uh, Beverly, yeah, Beverly Hills Housewives. I uh. get addicted because they get to be, many of them are friends and many of them are people I've known or been acquainted with over the years. It, 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 several are. But you just get, it, you just get like, you're like, I wonder what's happening over there today. Like, <laughs> you really do. Doesn't it seem sometimes, though, when you're looking at social media that a lot of the stuff that appears on it, uh, are people showing off or saying, <laughs> look at me, look at me, uh, which is, <laughs> says the guy who's on television <laughs> or was. Um, well, I, what I think is, 
Well, I, I mean, I of course it's it's fun to get into. Let's see, what is it? I guess what it is is it's sort of like it's made me listen to the news. I, I listen to it several times a day on NPR, like the five minute news, and then and then NPR politics is gorgeous. It's just an amazing show. But it's fi- it made me realize that there's it's so easy to get the wrong information if that's where you're getting it. But I think I had a sense of that, be- maybe because of my age or maybe because of just uh, growing up in a different time. I always had a sense of, well, who's saying this? You know, what's the source? But I do think social media, Twitter, and Instagram has sort of scrambled that up a little bit so people think they don't look I my husband will show me a headline I'll go where's it from <laughs> you know what I mean because that's sounds uh, like a little bit of propaganda yeah you know and then the other thing I think the social media has sort of been weaponized in a big way and I think that recent recent things that have happened have shown me that so I want to know what my friends are doing I want to know what people I don't know that I admire are doing I do I'm curious and I I get into it but I think you have to like and especially with AI and all the different ways that things can be misrepresented and you think you're just you think it's somebody telling you something you know there was this great there was an avenue Q but then there there was this great uh, video that my husband bought at an art show and it was all about it was kind of giving, sending up Sesame Street. Like, if someone talks to you like this with a puppet, they can tell you just about anything, right? It's like that. You have to be careful. <laughs> what I should you... have done the podcast <laughs> like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What haven't you done that you'd like to do before the career is over or before you hang it up? I would love... It's almost a cliche, and it's like, and my friends in the business that I, it will laugh at me, but I would, st- I would love to do Broadway. I would love to do a play on Broadway, not a musical. That would not be possible, but I, <laughs> that's not in the realm of reality. But I would love to do a play on Broadway. Put it out there. Yeah, yeah. Let the universe take over. He said. <laughs> Thank you, Perry. I've really enjoyed this. Me too. I could go longer, but I'm afraid. What will happen? What will go into? <laughs> so, yeah, we've already we've already probably. Well, we've talked about a lot of stuff. I I, I lost uh, two sisters uh, at an early age. I had a sister who was out here visiting me, and uh, I came home from work one day to find she drowned in my swimming pool. Oh my God! Yeah, that was a that was a rough one. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I was saying earlier today, I just feel as though there's, um, the older I get, the more and more people I'm losing. Well, you I've know. lost all my siblings. My, Have you? My little, my brother just passed away over the summer from a glioblastoma, and he was the third. I think I read that. And um, my sister, Patty, died during pandemic of the same sarcoma that my, our mom had. And my other little sister died a few years ago, and she she was 47 years old and had a heart attack. And I, I think there was a lot of smoking involved. So that's um, a really awful place to be. I'm the oldest, and to have lost all three of my siblings is heartbreaking. Yeah, I, I, I had uh, three sisters. My brother, and then there were three girls, and they all passed away. Um, the youngest was 13. I was 10 when she died. Uh, mm. She was um, profoundly, I hate to use the word retarded, but I don't, I don't know what the word the, to use. She had severe disabilities. And uh, that was hard. I remember that was hard. And my other two sisters, the one who drowned, I. You know what it's, like, what it's like having to pick up the phone and call your parents and say... No, 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 no. Becky's dead. Oh, my gosh. That was hard. And, and she had two daughters, and, you know, she'd come out to visit me like she did every year. And she had an asthma attack in the pool, they determined. So... The that best, is traumatic. The best... The best um, memory I have of her is she came out one year 
and uh, she was a big Barbra Streisand fan. And uh, I was invited to a screening of the movie Sweetheart's Dance was the name of the movie, and it starred Don Johnson. And at the time, Barbara was dating John and or Don, and it was a, a charity benefit screening. That and I asked my sister, couple. "Would you like to go?" Barbara Streisand's going to be there. And sure enough, after the screening, there was a little reception, and uh, her publicist came over and said, "Would would you like to meet Barbara?" sister was just in seventh. She, my, my nieces would say, did you have to do that? That's all she talks about, meeting Barbara Streisand. Uh, and of course, Barbara was very sweet and it was a, a wonderful memory that I have. Uh, you know, I yeah, I well, you were able to do, here. you were able to, to do that. Yeah. You know, I always think about um, the good stuff. Like I just, I actually just wrote an email to a friend about and sort of like summarize the last year or so that all of some really insane things have happened this past year. But it's like you, it makes you, it puts a spotlight on all the good stuff. It really does for me. Cause I, you know, am a Pollyanna Baptist girl from Texas. But you know, I, I love seeing David Hyde Pierce and here we are. It's a great, great show in New York. I saw him in Hello, Dolly. He was wonderful. Wasn't he great? Yes, he was. And um, I got to do a little play this past summer. With a, a, right after my brother died, I went and did this reading for a friend of mine. She was she was um, stepping down after 33 years as an artistic director at a theater in New Jersey. It's called the Shakespeare Theater of New Jersey. And she was starting this uh, classical reading program for kids because she said after the pandemic, she goes, they're not coming back. I mean, people are terrified to go into a closed space like that. Right. So her, she felt like her, what she could do for her theater was really intensely do outreach towards children to get kids back in the theater, you know, so that they grow up and, and want to come. And so she did The Little Prince and I have never understood that book. I tried to read it to my kid. It's the most read and the most sold book in the world of all time. I tried to read it to my kids, couldn't couldn't understand it. I just really didn't get it. But but performing it and and being directed and understanding what the other characters were doing, I finally understood the it's a heartbreaking. It's actually about losing a sibling. The whole book is. But this little boy that played the little prince was such a fabulous young actor. He's about 8 years old, maybe 10. And it reminded me so much of my little brother who was an actor, a child actor, and it was within a, two weeks of his death. And he left behind two boys in high school, which is so depressing and sad, but they were so loving to him. They, they were with him every second, so was his wife. They just circled the wagons. They just created a, a, a warm, loving place for him, and that mean, that's a lot, a lot of families can't or aren't able to do that they don't get the mm. opportunity as you know but this having this experience was so cathartic because I got to work with this young little boy actor and I just kept seeing my little brother in him and I'm like this what a gift this is you know to be able to I just sit off stage and think about this is a good place for me this business is a good place for me because it feels safe so I think yours. I think it feels safe for you too. So I think you're doing the right thing. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I need to hear that. I think we're done, Jim. Jim is such a good producer. <laughs> yeah. He shakes his head well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I agree. You were totally. You know, we got this all worked out in a couple of emails and texts. One of the um, I'm backtrack just a second. We also need to do like a real goodbye. Oh, oh, okay. okay. Uh, well, it was great talking to you. Thank you, you Perry. Have a I good really life. enjoyed having you here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for saying yes. You know, we're feeling our way through this. I've never done a podcast before, and so this is all new to me. Well, I think it's the same thing you've always done, right? Well, kind talking of. Talking with people. Yeah. Yep. Big names, famous <sighs> people. Yeah, big name. Big name. Eric McCormick's pretty great. You're right up He's there with Betty guy. Davis and oh, well. Maureen O'Hara, some of my favorites. Oh, my God. We used to live in a, a, when I first moved to L.A., I lived in this apartment building on Miller Drive, like right above Sunset. Miller's like, if you go up La Cienega and you cross Sunset, that's Miller. And we live in this old Spanish apartment building, 
like it was like Melrose Place. It, Melrose Place was on when we mm -hmm. lived there. But it was also, it had been a hotel at one time, and Betty Davis had lived there, and there was and there all kinds of people had lived Villa, there. Is it called Villa? Villa Madrid. Villa Madrid. I've seen pictures of it. Yeah. I'm sure I've driven past it, too. Yeah. Yeah, well, anyone that came over, and it was the man that, the guy that uh, managed the building, it, uh, other than us, you had to have some kind of a statue. So there was like Donna McKechnie and her Tony were in there, and... Um, you know, all, everyone had uh, some kind of award. I'm just trying to, uh, Michael Jeter was there, uh, Stocker Channing was there, like every, it was, as he had taken over the building, he, you could only get in if you were an award-winning <laughs> performer, which was so funny and, and, you know, very L.A. Very L.A., yeah. so Hollywood. Wow. And they were all wonderful people. Yeah. And um, the people that already lived there were wonderful, too. They, they, they enjoyed they enjoyed the people coming in. Well, I think a lot of the people who come out here is because of the history. And you want to be, feel like you're totally. a part of it somehow. Another friend of mine, I told you, has a podcast called From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. And he is, um, it's so funny because he wrote this blog for years. He's just upset. When he was at University of Tennessee, Anne Rutherford came to do a play and befriended him. And he, she said, you should come out, come out to L.A. So he did, and they were like the best of friends. And he tells these great stories of she'd take him through Beverly Hills, through the alleys, because that's where people throw out all their stuff, and they'd go, you know, dumpster diving. And at one point, they were picking up something out of the alley to put in her car, and they saw through the window there was an actress that used to be married to Howard Hughes, who was well-known at the time. I don't know her name now, but they saw her through the window. And she was just sort of stopped in time, just sort of staring and he wrote this whole blog about it, and it was it was a beautiful. It was he he loves these people, and so now he's got this great podcast called From Beneath the Hollywood Sign, and he tells these stories, and um, but he'll do groups like this week he's doing um, female character actors, but he won't he doesn't talk about the ones you know. He goes, I love Thelma Ritter, I love love lover, but we all know her. Let me tell you about this other person, <laughs> you know, and they'll get into something, and it's just like. It's so much fun. So I, I think there's room for anything you want to do in that world, you know? Roz had a little Thelma Ritter in her. Yeah, 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 for sure, for sure, for sure, yes. I met Ann Rutherford once. We were doing a, a whole bunch of things on uh, the, what was it, the 50th anniversary of Gone with the Wind in 1989. But I met her and Evelyn, I can't remember Evelyn's last name. Well, he got to know this guy named Hal, I want to say Hal Morley, Al Morley. Al Morley was the man's name, and I don't know what he had done earlier in his life, but he would throw this dinner party. Instead of giving, sending a Christmas card or doing anything for the holidays, he would just throw this big dinner party at the Magnolia, that pa piano bar. And, I mean, I literally walked in there once, and Paige, Paige, Paige Buchan, like this fabulous 90 year old piano player and they, you know, they had a mirror on the keyboard and he was just and then he was downing champagne they're like Paige stop it they were trying to get him to stop drinking and, and he and Marsha Hunt do you know who Marsha Hunt yeah she was a great friend of Al's and of Steve Cubine's and they one night we all went somewhere together and I said she lived really close to me and I said I'm going to bring my twins over to see you someday and he she goes call first she didn't. She like. Did, she didn't want to meet my twin babies. That was. She actually just passed away at like 104 years old. But you know, she was blacklisted, and then she went. Well, she went with that whole gang to Washington D.C. Humphrey Bogart and all of them, and then they all kind of got turned when they got there. And she was the one that didn't turn, and she was just completely blacklisted. But later, it later she. I was there at, um, I think they held it at the DGA because it was the biggest place, but SAG, the DGA, the WGA, Equity, all the unions apologized to the few that were left. Do you remember that? It no, was like 20 I don't years remember. ago. And one of them died on the way to the luncheon in a car accident. You know, one of the big ri the writers. Bad timing. He wrote Spartacus. It was. Oh. He, I, Not I, Dalton Trumbull. Yeah, well, it was the other one. Dalton Trumbull was there, and then it was the other one. So maybe I had, but it was the, so he was on stage thanking everybody, 
we got to hear him give us, you know, thank you for thanking us and thank you for this. And then the next day he was driving to a luncheon and died in a car accident mm. on the way to the luncheon. Isn't that the crazy? Yeah. Did you know Ronnie Chasen at all? Mm -mm. She was a publicist out here, big name publicist for a long time. She was going home from a party uh, for burlesque and she was shot and killed yeah. in her in her Mercedes Benz in Beverly Hills on her way home. What, did they ever? Yeah, it was, well, you know, I don't know, the guy uh, offed himself eventually, but he was in a flea bag hotel downtown and lots of people said not very kind things about him, but you know, it was just such a shock. Shock, I do remember waking up that morning yeah. to that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I'm You're so glad so you did welcome. this. You're welcome. I, me too. Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All things technical run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer is Jim Lichtenstein. <laughs>